collapsed all together. It was a moving feeling within me that I was sitting there demanding a God-given right. And my soul became satisfied that I was right in what I was doing. At the same time, with something deep down within me, moving me, that I could no longer be satisfied or go along with an evil system. That I had to be maladjusted to it. And in spite of all of this, I had to keep loving the people who denied me service, who stared at me. Well, that was John Lewis as a 22-year-old young man from Troy, Alabama, son of sharecroppers, fighting segregated lunch counters in Nashville, Tennessee. Lewis joined the Freedom Rides, marched from Selma to Montgomery, and was beaten brutally by police as he crossed the iconic Edmund Pettus Bridge. Lewis chaired the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and spoke before Martin Luther King at the 1963 March on Washington. Despite more than 40 arrests and serious injuries, John Lewis remained and remains a devoted advocate of nonviolence. Since his election in 86, he's served as congressman from Georgia's 5th District. Nancy Pelosi's called him the conscience of the Congress. I sat down with him when I was in Washington, D.C. recently for the One Nation rally, and he spoke about activism then and now. Congressman, I understand that uh, SNCC, an organization that you know well, recently celebrated a very important anniversary. Do you want to tell us about that? The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, better known as SNCC, did celebrate the 50th anniversary. We met uh, in a place where we were founded, at Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina. It was an unbelievable meeting. I saw individuals, I saw colleagues and friends that I had not seen in many, many years. People came from all over America, but some came from Europe from Africa, from Asia, uh, from Canada. Uh, they wanted to be together. It was like the coming home of a family. It was a homecoming. How did you reflect on the shape your home is in? How is our home doing as a multiracial, diverse society that you worked for so hard and risked your life for? Well, as a nation and as a people, as a home, as a family, we made a lot of progress. We'll come a distance. But we're still not there. We have not yet created the beloved community. We have not come to that point where we recognize the dignity and the worth of every human being. It is still a struggle. You know, sometimes people ask me whether the election of Barack Obama is the fulfillment of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. dream. And I said, no, it is only a down payment. We still have a distance to go before we create one family, one house, the American house. You were either a latecomer to the Obama camp or a stalwart supporter of Hillary Clinton, whichever way you want to put it. How do you think about the decision that you made in the end of that primary race finally to come out for Barack Obama? I think the decision that I made, and it was a tough and hard decision, was the right decision. Uh, I don't look back on it with uh, any uh, regret. Uh, I wanted to be on the right side of history. Uh, I love Hillary Clinton. I love uh, her husband, President Bill Clinton. We have been friends for years. And I wish there was some way that we could have the best of both. And we need the best of both right now. I, on one hand, I wish uh, Hillary Clinton was free uh, to get out on the road and campaign in some of these congressional districts and some of these states. Talking about campaigning, the Democrats, many of them in this country right now, are not campaigning on their record of achievement. Is that because the record of achievement is inadequate, doesn't excite the base, um, or is it for other reasons, and how would you explain those? I think it is a mistake for us not to campaign on our achievement, on our record. We have something uh, to talk about. We can talk about health care. Health care, we passed that piece of legislation. It is not all that we wanted, but it is a major step down a very, very long road. 
Some of us wanted single pay. Some of us wanted the puppet option. Come on now, some of us included you. I, I, I deeply uh, wanted a puppet option. I, I, I fought for it, I spoke up for it. And I think one day we will have a reform of the reform and uh, we will have a puppet option. So we have work still to do. We have a lot of work to do. The coalition of the 60s was historically and famously a labor civil rights coalition. And we see in this season a labor civil rights coalition that also includes peace groups, LGBT groups, La Raza, immigration rights groups. They came together in Washington for the One Nation rally. What happens next to that coalition? This coalition must stay together. We must pick up the best of what we had during the 60s. There was a great deal of solidarity. We all felt that we were all in the same boat. And I said all the time that maybe our forefathers and foremothers all came to this great land in different boats, different ships. But right now, we're all in the same boat and we're not gonna get out until we get out together. We have to stand up for each other, care for each other, speak up for each other, speak out for each other. What affect one of us affect all of us. We, we must champion the cause, not just of the African American community, not just the cause of low income whites, but the Latino immigrants, Native American, the gay community, we all must become one. Well, let's talk about health care. Here is an issue that people campaigned on. The public option was part of the promise of health care reform during the election campaign of 2008. That entire coalition that you talk about was on one side of that argument, the public option side. They elected Democratic majorities in both houses. They elected a Democratic administration with the first African American, the first black president. We didn't get public option. Where did that coalition fail? That coalition fell because we didn't have the, the power, the ability, the capacity to well together the votes in the Senate. And those of us in the House, for some strange reason, uh, had to buy to the wishes of the United States Senate. We needed, in a democratic coalition, people with guts, people with the ability to fight the good fight and not to cave in. So why was it possible in the 60s, certainly not a more progressive president, I wouldn't think, LBJ, why was it possible then and is not possible today? I think dur during the 60s, there was an all-consuming spirit, all-consuming ability on the part of people to say, this is what we want, this is what we need, and this is what we're going to get. You know, LBJ said from time to time, I, I cannot do it. We don't have the votes. Make me do it. And we made him. When we wanted to get the Voting Rights Act passed in 1965, he said we didn't have the votes in the Congress. And Dr. King and others of us said we would go to Selma, and we would write that act. Sometimes we have to find a way to dramatize the issue, to put a face on it. And on the whole debate on health care, was not enough drama. We didn't put a face on it. We had the Tea Party and others out in the streets. We needed masses of progressive people in the streets, demanding of, of this president, demanding of members of the House and the Senate to pass the more progressive and radical uh, health care bill. I've heard the story about make me do it since Barack Obama was elected, that we must do what happened in the 30s, what happened in the 60s, make the president do it. At the same time, I hear when there are demonstrations, when there's critique as there was over health care, from the left of the administration, the White House says pipe down. Many of our nonprofit leaders say pipe down. We must get behind the president. How, what is making him do it in this context? Members of the Congress, 
members of the coalition outside of the government, non-elected officials, must say, through their action, through their votes, and nonviolent protests, do it. Did LBJ not say, pipe down, because otherwise Barry Goldwater will get the upper hand? We don't understand. There's a right. You need to be at our back. On occasion, uh, LBJ did suggest, uh, stated, here we fail to be quiet and, and not make so much noise. We wouldn't get this. We wouldn't get that. But we had a spirit. We had a sense of determination. And it was the young people in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee that was sort of pulling and pushing the other leaders and other organization and individuals in court. We had a powerful coalition. You had the religious community, Protestant, Catholic, Jewish community, organized labor. We were there together, and we were on one accord. The labor community of that era had the Walter Ruthers in it. It had the history of strikes and shutdowns and sit-downs. We've had a few sporadic shutdowns and sit-downs, Republic windows and doors in Chicago, a few others like that. Would you like to see more of that kind of action? I, I would love to see more direct action, more nonviolent protests. Um, we, we need to get out front. I, I don't like a lot of the things that are going on in America today. I think we're too quiet. Uh, I think uh, we need to make some noise. We need to push. We need to pull. Um, we need to say to this president and to those of us in the Congress, we got to stop using our limited resources for military might, bring our young men and our young women home, and take care of our folks at home. Help create a more peaceful world. That beloved community. Many of us really didn't like what we saw happen on the street, on the steps of Congress at the height of the health care debate, as we watched you, beloved Congress people, experience the wrath of Tea Party activists. Maybe that's who they were. What actually happened on the steps that day? There have been a lot of rumors, the N word, spit. Did that happen? It did happen. Uh, what happened? It, it, people did call us names, they did use the N word. Uh, one of my colleagues uh, had to remove spit uh, from his face. Uh, it was ugly. It, it reminded me of another dark period in, in our history. But people have a right to protest. But during the 60s, we, we never, never called people out of their name. We try to do it in an orderly, peaceful, nonviolent fashion. I thought, I really thought that we had passed that period. But racism is deeply embedded in American society. We're not there yet. We have not yet created the beloved community. There's no such thing as a post-racial period in America. We still have a lot of work to do. How would you recommend that we people who are working for that beloved community, respond to the Tea Party rhetoric, the language, the organizing. Some say fight like with like. If they're going to call us names, socialist, fascist, whichever they choose, let's call them Taliban. Well, I don't think we should engage in a process that will pull us down to make us lure uh, we're better. We're better people. We're better citizens. We're better human beings. And we should continue to preach the way of love, the way of peace, the way of nonviolence. But we must confront the issue of race. We must confront the meanness. It's a lot of just meanness, hate, and people are so angry. You can have a sense of righteous indignation. You can take the high ground and, and stand up for what you believe in. But during the past few weeks and months with the Tea Party and the whole debate around health care, 
it seemed like it's been so organized and almost sponsored. And I think more and more reports are revealing that people have almost hide hand. Many of the protesters that came to our offices from all over America, they were hide in a sense. They were Freedom Works and other organizations and individuals sponsored them. We didn't have sponsors when we came to Washington in 1963. We didn't have sponsors when we marched from Selma to Montgomery in 1965. The young people that came to Mississippi in 1964, and three of my colleagues died, didn't have sponsors. We came out of that feeling that we wanted to redeem the soul of America, make America better. No one hired us during the 60s. We acted out of our sense of, we can't, we can't take it anymore. Uh, we saw something that was wrong and we had to make it right. We had to bring down those signs that said white men, colored men, white women, colored women, white waiting, colored waiting. We had to end segregation and racial discrimination. And that's why today I believe that in America, there's not any room for bigotry, for racism, anti-Semitism. There's not any room to discriminate against someone because of sexual orientation. And I sincerely take the position that I protest too long and work too hard, went to jail too many times, to end discrimination based on race and color, not to stand up and fight against discrimination based on sexual orientation. Congressman John Lewis, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. In August of 1963, there was the great march on Washington for jobs and freedom. 200,000 people were there, and everybody remembers Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech, but the most militant speech of the day was delivered by John Lewis, a student leader from the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. He's from Alabama. But he was pressured by established civil rights leaders to tone down his speech. But here is the part of the original speech that he had hoped to deliver that day. We march today for jobs and freedom. But we have nothing to be proud of. For hundreds and thousands of our brothers and sisters are not here. They have no money for their transportation, for they are receiving starvation wages, or no wages at all. To those who have said, be patient and wait, we must say that patience is a dirty and nasty word. Mm -hmm. We cannot be patient. We do not want to be free gradually. We want our freedom and we want it now. We all recognize the fact that if any radical, social, political, and economic changes are to take place in this society, the people, the masses, must bring them about. Mr. Kennedy is trying to take the revolution out of the streets and put it into the courts. Listen, Mr. Kennedy. Listen, Mr. Congressman. Listen, fellow citizens. The black masses are on the march for jobs and for freedom. And we must say to the politicians that there won't be a cooling off period. We won't stop now. All the forces of Eastland, Barnett, Wallace, and Thurman won't stop the revolution. The time will come when we will not confine our marching to Washington. We will march through the South, through the heart of Dixie, the way Sherman did. We shall pursue our own scorched earth policy and burn Jim Crow to the ground. Burn Jim Crow to the ground nonviolently. We, we shall fragment the South into a thousand pieces and put them back together in the image of democracy. We will make the action of the past few months look petty. And as I say to you, 
Wake up, America.